Today I'm going to give an update on my boa constrictor longicauda. Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. So my boa constrictor longicauda is now approximately nine months old. And um, compared to where he was when he was first born, he has gotten so much bigger. He's still a tiny little guy, though. Um, they're uh, described as a semi-dwarf uh, boa species. Um, he's a male, and males are supposed to get up to around five feet long, females about six feet, on average. Um, of course, there's going to be individual variation. He, um, like, uh, like many boas, they're um, slow-growing. Um, locality boas in particular have that reputation of being uh, slower growing than uh, the so-called morph boas, um, in part because they, um, they're not, they haven't been in captivity as long, and the nature of captivity tends to select for uh, breeding earlier, and breeding earlier tends to go along with growing up faster. Um, and and for, for the very simple reason that the faster an animal is able to breed, the quicker you breed it, and especially, uh, you see this really in morph projects, because uh, morph projects often involve the combination of various morphs, bringing new morphs in, combining them in interesting ways. So the sooner that you can, and especially because new morphs start off um, being very expensive, and morph combos being harder to produce become very expensive. So what some people do, or what a lot of people do, is you buy a bow with this morph and a bow with that morph and a bow with that morph, and then you breed them together to form the combinations that you actually are hoping for, getting a whole bunch of bows along the way, some of which you sell or keep or what have you. And because this is how it goes, as soon as you can actually successfully breed boas, you're going to do it plus or minus, I mean, you might wait a little bit, but when they're clearly about big enough, and most people will tend to try figuring that if the boa is capable of breeding now, it will, you know, the female will get gravid. And so, um, you know, the, the male will, will get the female gravid. And so the ones who mature faster um, will, you'll actually, you know, the, the breeders will actually succeed and they'll get offspring. And so there's an intrinsic selection for, for them. And even if you eventually breed the ones who take longer, you will have more litters from the boas that um, that bred earlier, simply because they will be, you know, be able to produce more litters over time, the, um, simply having done it for more years. But especially in morph projects, where you want to, you, you've got morph A and morph B, and then you want to breed them together um, to get morph A plus B in the offspring, which you then want to breed with something with morph C to get morph A, B, and C. Um, the thing is, once you have your A plus B morphs, you may well not breed the A and B together anymore. Um, you've gotten what you want, now you just sort of keep them as pets, maybe, um, you know, maybe you sell them or what have you, keep them as pets, etc. And so you will then tend to select especially for whatever breeds the soonest, which um, because of basic biology, tends to go along with growing up to be sufficiently sized and so on quicker. And so there's a very noticeable um, uh, aspect to how the boas that have been kept in captivity for the longest, and especially that have been um, kept in captivity for morph projects, tend to just mature faster than boas that are um, uh, lo just locality boas, where you're just breeding together boas from this locality to produce more boas that, that have this, at this point, locality ancestry, because there, there's a really curious thing that goes on. Um, I, I really noticed it more in reticulated pythons um, than in boa constrictors. Um, the uh, I'm sort of learning more about boa constrictors now and learned about retics a bit earlier. Um, but one of the things with localities is you are select, okay, so you start with a small subset uh, at least hopefully, <laughs> you start with a small subset of the locality in the wild. Ideally, you haven't taken all of the snakes from a particular location away, leaving none behind. But, um, so you start off with a small subset. So you've selected for something, um, you know, possibly completely randomly, but you have gotten only a subset. And the odds of having um, selected in terms of pattern, size, temperament, etc., um, entirely in a representative manner are pretty small if you're taking a small subset. Um, just statistically, you are likely to get an atypical sample if you don't take a big sample. Then, um, you are now selecting 
Um, no, this is where uh, part of why um, wild um, wild caught animals are ne- don't make nearly as good pets as captive bred animals. You are selecting now for the animals that will breed well in captivity. Now, there's a lot of um, there's a lot that goes into how an animal is in terms of what it grows up with. Um, th- that you know, all things with 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 any kind of animal intelligence are plastic to at least some degree, especially when they're younger, as they learn how to adapt to their circumstances. They learn what to do in them, what is a threat, what isn't a threat, and so on. And so, um, you know, captive born um, and raised will always be more docile than pure wild caught because they will be used to, from a very early age, these, you know, things with hands and so on, put their hands on you, and it's fine. Not a problem. And, you know, at first, little baby snakes might be scared. Um, one great thing about the the uh, boa constrictor longicata is, um, at least this guy, he was never scared of me. Um, I, I mean, he was occasionally scared in the sense of uh, he'd, he'd, like, curl up and, and be a little... Um, be shy. But he, he was never defensive. Um, he was never so scared that he needed to bite um, in order to protect himself. He's just always been extremely calm in that regard, which is very cool. And I, and I asked, and um, the breeder I got him from said that that's been his experience with all boa constrictor longicauda, is they're just, they're, um, they're not very defensive snakes. Um, you know, as babies, they're timid, but they're not, they're not defensive, which is pretty neat. Um, so he very quickly learned that um, we're not a threat, and if you move real fast near his head, like all snakes, they tend to pull back. Um, if you move something really close to a human being's head, we tend to jerk back too. But um, but I really um, I, I really enjoy that about him. He's just he's um, got a very calm personality. He's actually a good reading snake. I mean, eventually he'll be too big for it. But I, I've just sat there holding him, and as long as the ground isn't right next to him, he'll just happily sit on my hand as I read a book or something like that. But um, just just to get back to what I was saying about uh, about captive bred. Captive bred will always be better, but it doesn't take many generations before you are selecting for animals that thrive in captivity. Um, Because there's always going to be variation amongst the offspring, and then the ones that are very stressed by captivity are going to... they won't eat as well, they won't grow as well, they may not breed at all, whereas the ones who are least stressed by captivity will tend to eat more, they'll be healthier, um, they they won't have depressed... um, immune systems, they'll do great, they'll breed very readily, and so animals that do well in captivity will be very well represented in the offspring. And one of the things about not being stressed by being in captivity is not being stressed by people, and so they get a lot calmer around people. You're breeding for it intrinsically just by breeding for whatever produces more offspring. You are selecting in a captive environment, interacting with human beings, you are selecting for animals that do better with human beings. So th- there's a sort of intrinsic nature to it. Now, they, you know, uh, young snakes may be instinctively very aggressive and so on, and then mellow out over time, and because they spend most of their lives in their breeding life as adults rather than youngsters. So um, jungle carpet pythons, for example, have that reputation that they're really terrified and very defensive until they're about a year old and they calm way down. But you don't breed sub-one-year-old snakes, so them being stressed in the very beginning doesn't really uh, impact this very much. I'd still expect it to eventually calm down, um, just as it's not really selected for, because you don't need to bite to defend yourself, for the most part, when you are in captivity. Anyway, um, but there's another aspect. So, so right away, so you're breeding for the snakes who would not do well in the wild, but who do really well in captivity. So they're going to change there, doing things like growing faster, etc. Um, you'll also just be breeding for snakes that do better on your particular diet that you happen to feed them. Um, the uh, a, a lot of snakes in a lot of places feed on rodents of one kind or another. Um, I know Garrett has mentioned that for like uh, super dwarf reticulated pythons, they're probably uh, a lot of what they eat will be things like fruit bats. Um, you know, other flying stuff that managed to get out to their tiny little islands. And, you know, boa constrictor longicata don't come from a real huge area on, and they come from on the coast of Peru, but also slightly into to, uh, Ecuador. And so they, um, you know, there'll be particular animals that they eat there, and you can pretty much guarantee it's not lab mice and lab rats that are the animals that they eat there. Um, the way they hunt, etc., 
Like, like, just everything will change in captivity as you are selecting for animals that do best at once in captivity. And on top of that, what they look like. That people select for the things, the traits that they like in these subpopulations. And so, over time, the, the things that they like... So if I ever breed them, and I, I, I really want to get a female and have the possibility of breeding them, because I think boa constrictor longicata are just wonderful, wonderful pet snakes. They're just really, really... They're, they're just so much to like about them, and uh, their, their juvenile coloration isn't necessarily something you'd write home about a ton, but their adult coloration with the striking blacks and so on... Um, I'm looking forward to when he, he finally gets there in another year or two, um, based on pictures I've seen of other boa constrictor longicata. And with that adult coloration, which is what really matters because you spend most of your time with the snake as an adult, um, you know, they're gorgeous. Even at his age, I don't know if you can see from there, but the, um, the markings, uh, so the behind the eye and then the, the area in front, so it sort of goes like that. Um, it, it's already turning really jet black on him. and Like he's got a pure black tongue, which is... Uh, pretty cool and um this particular guy incidentally really likes being rubbed under the chin um he will even when he's moving if you start rubbing him under the chin he just stops there but if you touch him say on top of the head he bolts um he doesn't like being touched on top of the head but he will stay in one place for a long time just gently rubbing him uh, under his chin um and uh every now and again my ball python will like that or um or, or something sideways where it's a, a slightly, um, you know, sideways rubbing motion. My Rotec doesn't care for it at all. Um, but he really tends to go for it. The, um, I, I like that about him in, in particular. Anyway, so they have a beautiful pattern, so I, I may do that sometime. But I selected him based on a pattern and, and sort of, there was a sort of clean aspect, knowing that his pattern will change. Um, but he had a, a little bit lower of a, a saddle count. Um, than, than some of his siblings, for example. And, and there's just, I, I like the shape of his head spear um, versus others and so on. And this is selecting for it. And over time, you will change the look of it. You can see this, incidentally, uh, really clearly in the heavy selective breeding that's been done in jungle carpet pythons, where among the best, you know, most popular jungle carpet pythons, they have... You know, um, brilliant yellows and jet blacks that, that really stand out from each other with a pattern that just sort of um, calls to you from across the room. Um, you can get similar things in some boas uh, where they're selected for like really, really high peaked saddles and brilliantly red tails with very, very clean markings and so on. And then you compare them to a lot of wild caught individuals and you notice the wild caught individuals look a lot dirtier. The, 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 there isn't that super high contrast that's really easy to see from very far away, and so on. And um, and what happens over time, even as you are simply breeding them to others that are descended from a particular locality, is over time, since there's variation in the populations, you're picking from a different... You're, you're picking subsets that trend further and further away from what is sort of the average wild-caught individual from that locality. And so... There's a really curious sort of aspect to the whole locality collection thing, that unless you're constantly importing wild uh, members and possibly, you know, eventually, like, stopping, um, you know, cutting short the bloodlines of, 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 that have been in captivity for a while, um, over time, your captive populations are going to trend away. And in animals as variable as snakes... Um, as their patterns are quite variable, like look at, look at a bunch of sibling members, and they can look pretty darn different um, The uh, in, in terms of their patterns. it's um, So it doesn't take all that long before the question comes up of, well, okay, so you've got a pure boa constrictor longicauda. Okay. But, like, what does that mean? really, given that it's not like you have something which is identical to what came out of the wild. It's been bred for many generations. You know, Boa constrictor longicata, I believe, the, the original specimens, um, and there haven't been new specimens for a fairly long time, were, were something like 20 years ago. Um, and so there have been a, a, a possibly a bit longer than that, maybe more like 30 years. I, I have to look up the history again. But it was a while ago, and it, was, it wasn't a very large population that was taken um, wasn't from a very large area that, that they were found in. And so, um, they, um, 
the, the point being, over time and over a whole bunch of generations, is this like what you would find if you went out there? Well, to some degree, yes, and certainly descended from it, but in kind of the same way, like, it doesn't take very long to, uh, some of my ancestry is Greek, and there's an area in, um, on Long Island, uh, near, in New York City called Astoria, which had a very large Greek immigrant population, but it doesn't take all that long <laughs> for meeting the, the people who descend from people in Greece, here in Astoria, to see they've got a very different culture, they, they, you know, they still, you know, you, you can see the, the Greek influence in terms of curly, dark hair and, and certain aspects of facial features and olive skin. I um, don't have the olive-colored skin. You know, the dark, darker, more tan skin, even in the absence of sunlight. I didn't really inherit that part, unfortunately. Um, more, I take after more of the sunburn. Uh, in, in terms of my skin tone, I can tan, but I take over, take after, unfortunately, more of my relatives who sunburn more easily. I kind of wish wasn't the case. It'd be a lot more convenient to not sun sunburn nearly so easily. But anyway, be that as it may. Point being, um, that e even when you look at, at like my pure blood Greek relatives, yeah, they look like other people because they're only one generation removed, but their culture is very different. And in kind of a like manner, not that snakes particularly have a culture, they're mostly solitary animals, um, plus they're animals. But, um, but you can kind of see that analogous thing that once you isolate a subpopulation, it will over time change in different ways than the original population. So what is it? To, so I uh, am not much of a purist when it comes to whether you're talking about superdwarf articulated python localities or whether you're talking about boa constrictor localities. I'm not a purist in the sense of I'm not after the a pure representation of what is in the wild. I, I think there's a lot of, of sense in keeping the bloodline separate, not breeding other things in passing them off. I think they're, um, they're, they're for reasons of, of simple honesty, not like breeding them in and passing them off is good. And it has been, um, I, I'm not against crossbreeds myself, but there's a problem with crossbreeds, like breeding a boa constrictor longicata to something else. Um, is that they may look enough like the original that people who don't know better will assume they are pure-blooded originals, and then um, that will dilute the ancestry for people who do care very much about that sort of thing. Um, th there are sometimes other issues with, with going into crossbreeds as well that you have to be careful of, because sometimes um, breeding traits are you know don't work out very well when you mix them up. Um, but that said, so so I, I do definitely see the, the value of, of keeping it together, and that's why like I'd like to get a female uh, boa constrictor longicata to breed him with, um, just because I think there should be more boa constrictor longicata around. They're hard to come by and hard to find, and they're phenomenal snakes, so I think there should be more of them. And so I want the option, because uh, the thing is, it would be like five years from when I get it, it's the first time I could breed it, and so I can simply keep them as pets and not breed them and that would be perfectly fine, or, you know, five years from now I could decide I do in fact want to breed them, and, um, you know, five, six years, depending on the, you know, individuals, um, and give it a go, and see if I can, you know, help increase the, the size of the captive population. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to keep it, but with the recognition that what am I doing, it's a little bit closer, frankly, I think, to, like, dog breeds, that, like, yeah, there's sort of the romantic idea of, oh, this is like the the snakes that are in this particular part of the world, eh, kind of, over time, less and less. Um, I, I respect that, but I, I don't, I think it's sort of overstated. And to some degree, I think it's it's closer to the dog breed of, here's a really great snake that has these, I'm oh, sorry, I don't mean to scare you. Here's a really great snake that has um, these traits to it. And we're preserving these traits because we're only breeding snakes with these traits. And I think that makes more sense frankly, because there will always, whatever you have as this distinct subpopulation will remain that distinct subpopulation. Um, and then you can actually develop subbreeds off of it, um, where they just look very different, maybe even have different personalities or something. But um, you will eventually have these distinct subpopulations. You'll, you'll always have a distinct subpopulation. Whatever traits that distinct subpopulation has, it is a distinct subpopulation, and that's really the definition of a breed. Um, you can sort of formalize it a little bit, the way people do with dog breeds, to some degree. Um, 
but you're basically, you have an idea in mind that, like, these are the good qualities of the snake, and we're going to select the offspring on the basis of which ones really embody these good qualities. And as long as you don't have competitions that are judged with prizes, I suspect people will keep it fairly sensible. If you were to have the, the uh, American Snake Club, analogous to the American Kennel Club, where you had prizes, a hand, you know, people went in a show and you had prizes given by judges, you then run into the problem that the judges will have to have really weird taste, because over time too many people will be similar and then they've got to be really picky and specific and go for whatever is hard to achieve so that not many animals will be in the top contenders. And so the, the nature of judging things, where you have judges and prizes uh, uh, over a large selection pool, is it has to become weird. It doesn't matter whether you're judging animals, although you see this when judging animals, that if it's just like the animals with the biggest horns, well, people will compete for the animals with the biggest horns, no matter how ludicrously large these horns become, or the heaviest animals, or the animals that are best at this, or best at that, or um, uh, really classic ones, look at actual racing track greyhounds versus AKC greyhounds, and the AKC greyhounds look almost like a cartoon of the other one, because racing track greyhounds are selected by being fast, um, which is a complex biomechanical thing that selects for various traits like big heart, big lungs, strong muscles, um, but not too big because you have to propel all these things and, you know, a deep chest to, to pack lots of muscle, but not too deep because it ceases to be functional when it's too deep. There's sort of an optimal size, an optimal trade-off. So uh, racing greyhounds are, are sleek and slender as well as having big chests and lots of muscles. It's a really interesting trade-off, whereas AKC greyhounds have like huge chests and itty bitty teensy little waists that don't really have enough muscle on them to run super fast. And, um, and other things like that where you look at them and you're just, huh? It's sort of like a greyhound. Um, but you also see it in bodybuilding. Uh, when people are doing bodybuilding competitions. If you look at bodybuilders back in like the 1960s, which is approximately when bodybuilding is really getting started, um, a as a thing where there's shows, judged shows, um, you had strong people who also developed their muscles to be to be bigger than necessary to be strong, but it, for aesthetic purposes, or just who grew big muscles in the, you know, in in the practice of getting strong, and who would show this off. Okay, this tended to be pretty reasonable. They had, you know, actually survivable amounts of body fat and so on. And then over time, their their muscles got bigger and more cartoonish. And granted, admittedly, part of this is, is the influence of steroids, but the judging pushed in the direction especially of hyper-low body fat. So big muscles is important in bodybuilding, but also because it's very hard to get insanely low body fats. And by insanely low, I mean, like, unsustainably low. Like, they dip... Bodybuilders starve themselves to have exceedingly low... Um, body fats that are not really sustainable and sort of what they're doing is they're aiming to die you know contest prep is like my, my show is in uh 12 weeks so i'm going to aim to die from starvation in 14 weeks um so that as soon as the contest happens i'm gonna start eating again and putting on enough body fat to actually live um the effects of this are even more visible in female bodybuilders than male bodybuilders. Um, but yeah, it takes them literally months to recover, and their health is, is sort of crashing on them. And, um, and what I described is not literally the case. But it, so, so they're going for this really incredibly hard-to-achieve thing, because if what you're trying to do is incredibly hard to achieve, as a lot of people are doing it, the judges have an easier time telling who is actually at the top, because if everybody can, you know, it, it is sort of a hair's difference from each other, judging becomes too arbitrary for the judges to be able to do it, but when they have ridiculous standards, um, then very few people can achieve it, and judging is, is, though always subjective, much less subjective, and the judges can more reasonably actually award prizes on the basis of, of things they could actually describe in terms of the difference, that like here, you know, you can really see the visible muscle striations in this part of the body that you should never ever be able to see visible muscle striations in, because this is one of the last places the body has fat in, and um, you're, you're you don't have enough fat to actually live, and uh, uh, it's, it's kind of crazy. But that's the point. Judging always makes things crazy. So as long as snakes stay safe from judged competitions, they probably won't get crazy. But what will they get? Well, they'll come to conform to some sort of ideal that various breeders like about them. Some will be for aesthetics, some will be for some other things. Some people will pick really big ones, really small ones, whatever. Um, and you'll, you'll see some variation. And um, the one thing you won't see really is, is a sort of static stability.
to it. And so I think that's just, you know, sort of the important thing to keep in mind when it comes to locality sneaks, is that whatever it is about the locality that you like, the one thing that you will not get is, over time, everything about the snake staying the same. So whatever you do like, it's not that this is exactly a representation of the wild, because unless you got it from the wild, it's not. And even if you did get it from the wild, there's a decent chance that it's unlike a fair number of other snakes you could have gotten instead if you happened to come across those. Um, so, um, yeah, localities are really fascinating. And for me, I just love that they, there's some really, really, really great snakes. Um, I, I love this guy. And uh, after I, I get my, my female boa constrictor, Longicata, I, I really encourage everyone to, to look for them because they're phenomenal snakes. But, but not before then, please, because I really want one. And, uh, yeah, they're really great. I'm looking forward to when he's bigger. He's still tiny. And uh, um, he's a lot of fun, and, and my kids love him too. And uh, it's always a little stressful because he's so small relative even to my five-year-old. Um, when he's a bit bigger and thicker and so on, that, that'll be kind of nice. But you really need to be patient with... Uh, with them, they just they don't grow super fast. They, they um, right now he's here. You know, if I can get you to stretch out a little bit, um, if you can see him, he's somewhere in the neighborhood of about two feet long, approximately. Um, he's still very thin. He's reasonably tall, but very thin. He um, is not a thick snake, and so I, I feed him. Um, right now, I'm feeding him once a week. I feed him, and when he hits a year, I'm gonna I'm gonna back off on the feeding schedule. But once a week I feed him, it used, for a long time it was hoppers, recently he's, uh, about a month ago, I think, he switched over to adult mice. Um, they disappear, I feed him at night, most of, like, with the adult mice I can see a bulge in him the next morning by that evening, so within 24 hours you cannot tell at all that he, he ate recently. So it's a nice small meal that um, he's never regurgitated or anything like that. Um, always seems in excellent health. There's uh, his sides, you can um, you can feel the muscle and ribs right there. He doesn't uh, bulge up in anything. So I don't, um, it, it's, it's a little bit of a fast feeding schedule, but because I feed him very small things, um, and actually even with hoppers, what I, what I ended up doing was I, um, I, I got a large bag, I got a bag of hoppers and then I, um, but there's a bunch of variation in what's considered a hopper. So I started with the smallest of the hoppers back when he was um, only about six weeks. Uh, I got him when he was seven weeks old, I think. Something like that. Seven, seven eight weeks old. Or six, six, seven weeks old, I think. Forget exactly. Um, and so, um, anyway, so I started with the tiniest of the hoppers. And then eventually worked up to the biggest of the hoppers. Because, um, as I said, there's a range, and that was over the course of... I, I, got, I started with 24 hoppers, so over the course of uh, um, t something like that, 24 weeks. Um, and, you know, they, he's still, you know, growing pretty fast. So he, he kept that because I he varied the size um, doing it that way, which is kind of a, a, a nice way of being able to get the, uh, you know, the variation in sizes to give him the, the really, really tiny thing when he was tiny. So it, it, the, the bulge in him never lasted... Um, never lasted really a full 24 hours. Um, it was always gone nice and quickly, so it was a nice small meal. Um, and, uh, I mean, so far, that was what the, the breeder recommended um, uh, to me. And it's, you know, once a week for, for boa constrictor longicata is a little bit on the fast side, but for, for a neonate under a year old, it's not unreasonable. It's, it's not, I mean, that's not a power, for, you know, when... when one small thing once a week is not a power feeding schedule. And so, um, so I did. He's been growing very nicely, seems to be in good health, not fat, um, not emaciated, um, growing nicely, but still nicely for a snake that grows slowly. Um, so not too fast. And as I said, um, you know, the, the feeding schedule, I'm going to be backing off from, from once a week once he hits a year old. And uh, um, yeah, I love him. As I said, once I get my, my female boa constrictor longicata, I highly recommend them, but not until then. And uh, I've been rambling on for far too long here, so 
Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.